I remember the day with perfect clarity. The house was filled with my family. I, being significantly older than all of my cousins, was the designated babysitter. That particular day, my cousins and I decided to make bracelets. Lonesome beads sank besides our legs, and I realized the bracelets were, the beads weren't mine. They were Sahana's, my younger sister. As our older sibling, we maintained a personal language, one marked by a distinct clause. As both her nemesis and her best friend, I wasn't supposed to touch her stuff. I told my cousins I need to return the beads to Sahana, and they looked at me with curiosity and confusion until I realized what I had said. Sahana had died a few days prior. My sister was a unique case, dying within six days of her diagnosis. Sahana's story from a medical standpoint was lost since the beginning, but her end began inconspicuously. What led up to her diagnosis was fatigue and vomiting, both of which are typical of picky eaters. But the doctor prescribed probiotics, something that should have helped. Instead, Sahana continued to deteriorate. During this time, I kept her entertained as she remained home in bed. I faced towards my closet, looking for some game she would enjoy. As I turned around, my elbow launched into her eye socket. I had no clue she was standing behind me. She brushed off the pain, saying she was fine, and I believed her. Until the next morning, she woke up with a black eye, and she said she couldn't see. For a moment, I thought I blinded my sister. And looking back on the situation, I think it would have been better than the alternative. Little did we know, bruising is a telltale sign of acute myeloid leukemia. Sahana was admitted July 10th and would be confirmed dead on July 16th. I had witnessed the doctor unplug my sister from a ventilator. For the funeral, I dressed up her corpse in ornate Indian garments, applying lipstick to her frozen lips. For the funeral, I watched her body go up in flames as they cremated her. I had seen my sister die right before my eyes. How is it that part of me still included her in my plans, as if she was alive? When I browse through stores, I still consider buying her something. When my mother asked me to set the table, I still almost ask her if I should call my sister for food as well. It is only now, 10 months later when I'm writing this talk, that I can begin to explain why it is that I still see her on these terms. In an increasingly secular society, Cultural practices still determine how we grieve. In Hindu culture, after someone passes, it is typical for rituals and customs to take place, lasting weeks. After death, the house is to be lit with sage. The diets of those in the household are altered to remove food containing garlic, meat, or eggs, foods that are essentially considered impure. They are also not allowed to cook in the house until the body has been burned. For Sahana, my family's closest friends brought aluminum trays of home-cooked meals. For the funeral, the mourners placed rice in her mouth, coins in her hand, and flowers on her body. Twelve days after, the traditional rites included twelve young girls joining together to have a religious meal and listen to hymns. Afterwards, the ashes are to be thrown in the Ganges River, a river meant to purify the soul. Instead, my family spread Sahana's ashes in Key Biscayne, an American take on the traditional funeral rites. All of, these process, all of these processes are meant to ease the soul into the afterlife. But I asked my mom when it would end, when I could be alone with my emotions. And to that, she responded, all of these rites and practices, they're meant to ease the soul into the afterlife. This is the way we grieve as a culture. It is only now that I can begin to understand how I can speak to you today, my eyes free of tears when I talk about Sahana. This is largely due to cultural influence. All of these practices and rites, seeing my sister honored this way, I have no doubt in the world that she died loved and cherished. I'm still in utter disbelief that all of these processes can be so cleansing and so healing. 
I tried support groups like Compassionate Friends, believing perhaps that this was the only way to heal, only to realize that I preferred another way. Globally, Asian Americans are less likely to attend treatment than any other ethnic group. And when they do attend treatment, they receive the least, two sessions on average. The day my sister died, I thought that I would die with her. I thought that I would spend my years sobbing away in a therapist's office. It is only now that I realize the spiritual healing that I've done. This collective ideology of the family over the individual in Asian cultures is the reason I grieve the way I do. I have not accepted Sahana as gone, simply because she is not. Death is the physical loss of a person. Sahana is dead, but she is everywhere. I see her in ingredient labels, which I've gotten in the habit of checking due to her severe allergies to eggs, cashews, and sesame seeds. I see her in stuffed animals, each whom she gave a distinctive personality. I see her in thunder and rain, which scared the daylights out of her as she cuddled with me, too afraid to be left alone. She is everywhere. The essence of her soul lives with me. In the death process, the funeral tends to be the hardest part, simply because we associate so much importance to the physicality of the person. We associate with what is visible to the eye. But in Indian culture, someone can live on long after death, in the marks they leave behind on those who they love. A casket does not signify a spiritual loss. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, the dead surround us. So today, I pose the following questions. How do you grieve? How do you cope in the face of tragedy and hardship? How does your culture affect the way you view the world? My culture, my worldview, allows me to believe that Sahana is always communicating with me in a form akin to the Morse code a language used through the flicking of lights and dots. It is also used electronic, electronically through dashes and dots. It is a form of speaking without words, a personal communication between the speaker and the listener. Our language consists of stuffed animals and ingredient labels and thunder and rain. I know I'm never alone. I see it in the basis of Hinduism and all the items that she's left behind for me. She has left dots and dashes scattered for me throughout the world. I see her in everything and everywhere I go. I still keep her memory alive. I include her in all my plans. She's forever my long distance sister, watching over me from above. I live for two now, and with every breath I take, I take one for both of us. Thank you.